Hey everyone! In today's video, we are going to dig into Nolan and discuss the implications it has on the rest of the Rise and Fall series and the world of Elan as a whole. There were several things I missed on my first read-through, and there are some innocuous lines that could hold deep repercussions for the future books. But before we get started, just a spoiler warning. We will be discussing potential spoilers for Nolan, all of Raiyera Revelations, all of the Legends of the First Empire series, Death of Dolgath, and Disappearance of Winter's Daughter. Also, the way this video is structured, we will start with the obvious implications and then work our way to the more exciting but easy to miss concepts, and we'll even throw in a dash of speculation here and there. But I've talked enough, so let's begin. Starting with the general implications, the first item we need to touch on is where the book left us. Nolan has become Emperor, thereby ending the reign of Nephron and marking the beginning of the line of mere Emperors. We saw the formation of the Teshlor Knights and got a glimpse into how they will fit into the Empire, acting not only as protectors of the Emperor, but also as the Emperor's representatives to the provinces, making sure new laws and charters are upheld. This also brings up an important point, as later in the Empire, the Teshlors will be balanced with the Senjars. But we currently see no trace of magic in the Empire as Nephron had outlawed it. In fact, the only beings who know the art, west of the Nidwalden that we know of, are Mwandale, Trilos, Turin, and Makareta. And since the Senjars are well established during Ezrahaddon, this means they were either started some time between books, or that this formation will be a major plot point in Fairlane. The next big change in the Empire revolves around human rights. Especially with Sephirin as Empress, we expect we will see a major shift in the Frey human dynamic. Of course, during Rhaeyra, the Mir have been demoted to the bottom rung of society, but that is several hundred years after the Empire's collapse, so we don't know what that dynamic will look like during Fairlane and Ezrahaddon. One interesting thing to note is that most of the full-blooded Frey in Nolan live in Meridid, which had become a sprawling city. But if we look at this area on a Rhaeyra map, there's just nothing. We believe that the fall of Meridid occurred after the collapse of the Empire, and know that many of the Mir ended up in Rochelle. But what happened to the full-blooded Frey descendants? That we do not know. Also, speaking of Sephirin, we end the book with her breaking Pharaoh's law, which will inevitably lead to her being denied entrance to Pyre. This point seems to open up more questions though, as we don't see Sephirin as a spirit in later ages like Makareta or Trilos. So could there be a way for her to enter Pyre with Malcolm's help, who certainly would seem to owe her, such as using the Key of Eaton, which we believe Muriel is still in possession of? Only time will tell that story. Next, we have Mwandale. This Mirrorleaf is still at large, as would be expected since we know he will play a large role in both Ezrahaddon and Rhaeyra. So the real question will be if we will see him in Fairlane as he makes another grab at becoming Fane. But whether or not Mwandale appears in Fairlane, we do expect him to use his time between Nolan and Ezrahaddon to continue to become stronger, whether that is through more training with Trilos or some other approach. Here is Sullivan in a Q&A from last month, talking about the evolution of Mwandale during the Rise and Fall. What you're seeing is that you saw him as a youth. You saw how he was formed. And then as you get to Nolan, or, or as you get to the, yeah, I guess the beginning of that, you see how he's now starting to become more formidable. By the time you get to the end of the series that you're presently reading, he's going to be a different person. He's going to be much more frightening. We also have the issue of the Horn of Glendora and the Erevan Frey. At the end of Nolan, Tekchin tells Zephyrin more specifics about how the horn works, but he does not think it is a good idea to perform the ceremony, even with himself yielding to Nolan, for fear that they might perform it wrong, and as soon as they sound the horn, all the Erevan Frey will hear it and will be able to invade if Nolan is not properly made fain. Tekchin goes on to tell Zephyrin, Also, the horn has to be kept a secret from everyone. So you know where it is? Tekchin nodded. But you won't tell me? Someday I will. 
We then see Tech Chin dip out after the wedding ceremony so that he is not forced to tell Zephyrin. We do know by the time that we get to Ezra Hodden that Ezra Hodden has possession of the horn because of his exchange with Emperor Narion. The Emperor shook his head. The horn? I placed it in the tomb. So, similar to the Senjar issue, the discovery of the horn could happen between books or be a main plot point in Fairlane or Ezra Hodden. As for the Erevan Frey, we know that they met with Emperor Narion during Ezra Hodden's time, so it seems that they found out about Nefren's death at some point. This almost certainly will come out in Fairlane or Ezra Hodden, and could even be told from the point of view of the Frey, as we found out from Sullivan when he was asked if we will see what is going on with the Frey still in Erevanon during the Rise and Fall. Okay, this is something that even Robin doesn't know, but yes, you'll see some of that. We're going to get the background on uh, um, what's going on in Irvinon and several other things that are going on. One interesting thing to note about his answer is that he mentioned Robin, his wife, didn't know this. And as she is his alpha reader, we can guess that she has already read Fairlane, meaning this Erevan Frey narrative is likely going to happen in Ezra Hodden. Next, the Trilos vs. Turin, Chaos vs. Balance continues to be an overarching theme as it has been throughout the books. Trilos has been teaching Wandelay and setting up his plan for revenge, while Turin has been making preparations of his own through Jeryl, Arvis, Tekchin, and probably others. There is one large change in the dynamic though. While we already knew from Legends that Turin cannot see Trilos, I can't see him any more than I can see into Pyre, but I can witness the effects of his actions. In Nolan, Trilos is just learning this important detail. We may have learned something very important today, such as, perhaps Torin can't predict what I will do. Maybe he can only witness the effects of my actions after they occur. Like a blind spider, he may not be able to see me and he only knows I'm nearby after feeling the vibration of the web as I move through it. That would be a very important piece of information to have at my disposal, and it should be very easy to test such a hypothesis. Knowing this would be a very important tool for Trilos, and we may get to see him test his hypothesis, as he puts it, in Fairlane or Ezra Hodden. We of course know that we will see more of these two down the line, as Trilos will be Yulric in Ezra Hodden, and Turin plays a large role in Rhaera. But interestingly, we don't see Trilos in Rhaera, which means something drastic must happen in Ezra Hodden. We will just have to wait and see what it is. And for our last general implication, we have the Gazelle, or as it is pronounced in Nolan, Gazel. We see that the Empire is still actively fighting the Gazelle on the Airbond Forest Front during Nolan, and that the Gazelle were willing to attack Persepolis directly through the underground waterways, though theoretically those passages have now been sealed. The Gazelle seem likely to play a continued, and perhaps even larger role throughout the rest of the series, as some readers have noticed something interesting on the Nolan map. In the Legends map, we have nothing on the gazelle-held areas. And on the Rhaera map, we don't get much more. But on the Nolan map, every island of the Baron Archipelago is named. We have the names of cities and areas both in the area southeast of Erevan and east of Kalinia. This leads us to believe this information will be important and we may even potentially visit some of these areas in Fairlane or Ezra Hodden. Sullivan confirmed some of this as well when asked about if we will finally learn more about this race in the remaining books of The Rise and Fall. Oh yeah, so it, it's very big, uh, but yes, you'll find, uh, you'll get the background on the, the goblins that you've always wanted to know and you're gonna get the background. So now, we get to discuss some of our juicier topics. For our first one, we must begin at an unsolved mystery from the Legend series. Back when Age of Death came out, there was a scene where Turin was asked where he had been, and he replied, many places actually, 
Tyre, Carrick, Neath, and a little point of land that juts out into the Green Sea. This little point of land that juts out into the Green Sea is the place in question. And despite being discussed on Reddit and in Discord, no answer was ever discovered. But in Nolan, we had a line that sounded eerily familiar. Mwandalay had diligently worked for centuries to make his dream come true. Some of that time he'd spent in a hideous castle on the Green Sea, some in Persepolis, and the rest in the southern province of Marinonia. Looking at the Nolan map, we don't see any castles on the Green Sea, but if we switch over to the Ryura map, there is a castle we are very familiar with, Blythen Castle, which was featured in The Disappearance of Winter's Daughter, and it was in that book that we learned, after the death of the last emperor, his family, and the destruction of the capital city of Persepolis, Bishop Venlin stepped in and took over. It was the bishop who officially moved the empire from somewhere in the west to here. At that time, this was the imperial province of Alburnia. The bishop, that's what the patriarch was back then, actually ruled the remains of the empire out of Blythen Castle until he finished his cathedral. It would make sense that Mwandalay, who was disguised as Bishop Venlin at the time, would return to the same castle that he was already familiar with. So it certainly seems that Blythen Castle is an important place, made even more so as this is where the Soret Knights will be based out of later on. And this clip of Michael and Robin, where they are discussing Winter's Daughter and how it relates to the Rise and Fall series, certainly seems to cement that there are loose ends that will have links to the series. And Blyneth Castle comes up. Evelyn, Evelyn talks about Blyneth Castle a lot. Well, you, you should have figured this out. When you got to the end of Winter's Daughter and there was a loose end. Well, I knew, I knew, I knew, there, I knew there was this uh, tomb yes. that the big battle takes, care, you know, takes place of. And I knew that there was, I was like, there's somebody, somebody, you know. But, 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 but it was much worse than that because... Because the diary. There's an unexplained death. Next is Bran. Bran is, of course, Ronan Gifford's son, who as a human would have died hundreds of years before Nolan takes place. And at first read, it seems that we don't get much more information about him after he left Persepolis, except that he went to Dulgath and then headed far off into the east, not to be heard from again. But when we put together the information we learn about Bran from Brother Seymour, with what we learn from Nyssa, aka Makareta in Death of Dulgath, a far more interesting story starts to unfold. From Seymour, we learn that Bran was in search of the Book of Bryn, the second Book of Bryn. This is almost certainly referring to the portion of Bryn's book which was taken by Trilos at the end of the Legend series. As for why he would go to Dulgath in search of the book, we can turn to Makareta's account. The rumors of my miracles had traveled all the way to Persepolis. When he heard, he came looking for answers. His name was Bran, and he was looking for someone. Not me, as it turned out, but I think something led him here and brought us together. Bran recognized me the moment we met. Not specifically, not my name, but he said he knew what I was, what I'd done. He'd been taught about my sort and knew what to look for. So it appears Bran very well may have known that it was Trilos who had the book, and may even have known what Trilos was. Enough at least to be able to search for clues of his kind. Though the question remains how Bran would have known all this. It could be possible that he learned it from his parents and Suri, or perhaps he even got some help from Turin. Regardless, when Bran gets to Dulgath, hoping to find, perhaps, Trilos, he instead finds Makareta. After establishing his monastery, he heads far into the east to continue searching for the book. But why he went far into the east, we don't know for sure. But we do have one last clue. In Winter's Daughter, near Rochelle and Blythen Castle, there is the tomb of Falkirk de Roche, first disciple of Bran. Could Bran have tracked down Trilos to Blythen Castle somehow? 
We are now probably fully in the realm of speculation, but it is almost certain that the story of Bran has a further role to play and that we will learn more information in Fairlane and Ezra Hodden. For our next topic, we go back to the Nolan map and to the Gazelle territory. We have already discussed how the naming of the Gazelle lands is new, but there is also something deeper. I am going to put up a list of the gods of the early humans, which we get from the beginning of the Legend series, and you can pause the video and see if you notice anything interesting. All right, let's see how you did. As you can see, there is overlap between the gazelle names and the ancient deities of the humans. This points at a common history between the gazelle and humans, which we already know happened, because at one time all four of the major races lived together in Erebus before there even were different races. So why is this important? Let's take a look at this clip of Sullivan explaining how he will often take simple concepts or events and expand on them later. So the, the problem is, is that there's a lot more information. And like I always say, I, I, I tend to give simplified answers for things in the story that readers take as being a definitive answer. And then I revisit that answer and expand it a little bit more and you go, oh, oh, okay, so I didn't know that. The idea that the original how the gods were originally laid out in Rhaera is very different from how you see them as we get more in detail. And so now you've got more information about people like Alan and Eaton and such and so forth and the beginning of the world. But that's not completely the whole story either. That is a synopsis that Alan gave to uh, Bryn in a way that she could easily understand it. This means that while we may know the basics of prehistoric Alan, including Turin's War, which killed the rest of the Aesir and fractured the races, there's still much more we don't know about that story. So these tiny hints, such as the Minogon, Arafis, and Kroon, are small hints to what that fuller story of the Aesir may be. We do happen to know that Arafis was the original word for sea, which makes sense with how the humans and gazelle use that word. But what could the other words mean? And who was Galarabrin? And why exactly did Turin not want Trilos to be with Muriel? Turin's a dick. We will just have to wait and see. And finally, the last item we have deals with Tech Chin and a single line from Sephrin while talking about her father. You know, it has been hundreds of years now, but my father is still alone. He keeps busy teaching young Instaria how to sword fight. At first, this may seem like a completely innocent line, except when we start to think about what are the chances that the Tech Chin, as in the Teshlor Discipline, is the only discipline still being taught by its founder after the formation of the Empire, and at the time of Rhaera, is the only discipline known by people outside of the Guardians, aka the Pickerings. This may just be a coincidence. But what if it's not? So now that we know that there are Instaria being trained in the Tech Chin at the time of Nolan, let's fast forward to Rhaera and recap how the Pickerings learned it. The first Pickering to learn the Tech Chin was Cedric Picolarinon. In a time after the Empire fell and after the reign of the Glen Morgans, there was a warlord from the north named Lothamad who attacked south but was defeated by Tolin Ezendin, ancestor of Ulrich and Arista. This Lothamad is the namesake of the nearby mountain range. Tolin Ezendin's victory led to the formation of Melangar, and Ezendin would then reside in Medford, while he gave his loyal general, Cedric Picolarinon, the Galilin province. In the Crown Conspiracy, Ulrich states, Rumor has it that Cedric learned the ancient art of Tek Chin from the last living member of the Knights of the Order of the Fallid. We have since learned that the name Fallid is actually a derivation of the fray word Fallid, which means Tooth of the Dragon, which hints that this order may have elven heritage. 
On top of that, if we switch back to the Nolan map, take a look at what Lothamad's mountain range was called. Dragon's Teeth. So perhaps the path that led the Pickerings to knowledge of the Tek Chin did not go through the Teshler Knights at all, but rather through the Instaria of Meridid and a Frey Order of the Fallen. We do expect to see more of this story to be brought to light in Fairlane or Azrahaddon. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Be sure to subscribe and watch my other videos to learn more about the world of Ilan and Rhaera. Thanks!